Greetings, and welcome to the Life Technologies Conference Call entitled An Introduction to Flow Cytometric Analysis Using Molecular Probe Reagents. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A brief question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It is now my pleasure to introduce your host, Ms. Jolene Bradford. Thank you, Ms. Bradford. You may begin. All right. Well, thank you for joining me today. This is the first part of our flow cytometry reagent webinar. My name is Jolene Bradford. I am the Research and Development Associate Director of Flow Cytometry Systems, located in Eugene, Oregon, which is the home of molecular probes. Before I start the presentation, I'd like to make a few announcements. First, feel free to submit questions during the presentation. I'll try to answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. It's likely, however, that I'll answer some of the questions after the webinar has ended. In January, we will be providing an overview of reagents that can be used for viability, vitality, and apoptosis, and this will be presented on January 12th, and you can register now. Today's webinar is the first in a series that will continue throughout 2012. We will provide in-depth technical webinars on individual topics, introduce various procedures, applications, and reagents, and include basic techniques and tips and tricks for running experiments in flow cytometry. So today's webinar will provide an overview of cell proliferation reagents, including reagents for both live and fixed DNA content, cell tracing using dye dilution, click it EDU for direct S phase measurement, and a new method for measuring changes in proliferation using EDU and BRDU together. So first of all, let's begin with cell cycle DNA content. The eukaryotic cell division cycle comprises a series of events that are involved in the growth, replication, and division of cells. Cell cycle describes the progression of a cell through a division of cycle. There are cytoplasmic events and there are nuclear events. G1 cells induce growth by first making RNA and proteins. However, the DNA content does not change. In S phase, DNA synthesis proceeds with DNA replication, and cells have variable amounts of DNA. Cells in the G2 phase have completed DNA synthesis and continue to grow and prepare for mitosis, and DNA is maintained at double the original amount. In the M phase, or mitosis, nuclear division and cytoplasmic division give rise to two daughter cells. Often in talking about cell cycle and flow cytometry, we describe the distribution of a population of cells in the different nuclear phases. DNA content analysis is one of the most widely used applications in flow cytometry. During the S phase, cell, cells undergo DNA replication so that when they enter the G2 phase, they have twice the normal amount of DNA. Looking at the amount of DNA within the cell indicates the proliferation state of the population and can be used to examine the effect of drugs that affect the cell cycle, something that is particularly important in development and cancer research. In this approach, cells are incubated with dyes that bind stoichiometrically to DNA. This means that the dye binds in proportion to the amount of DNA present in each cell. Using linear fluorescence, if, staining, if the staining is stoichiometric, the fluorescence of the 4N cells will be exactly twice the fluorescence of the 2N cells. Under ideal staining conditions, all the cells with the same DNA content are expected to be uniform in staining. However, in practice, the cell populations are represented on frequency histograms with peaks of various widths. This variation results from differences in staining, dye loading, and instrumentation. So this shows the histogram on the left as uh, gotten from the instrument, and it's difficult to accurately put markers on the different phases because there are actually three overlapping distribution curves. 
DNA content histograms often require mathematical analysis in order to extract the underlying phase distributions. Methods to derive cell cycle parameters from DNA histograms raise, range from simple graphical approaches to more complex deconvolution methods using curve fitting or logarithms to correct for debris and aggregate modeling, and this is seen in the uh, example on the right. So dyes which have the ability to penetrate an intact cell membrane to stain nucleic acids are cell permeant or live cell dyes. These can be used to determine the DNA content of living cells. The dyes listed are also DNA selective, meaning they do not label RNA. All of the cell permeant dyes are essentially non-fluorescent until bound to DNA. With cell permeant DNA selective dyes, live cells are incubated in the presence of the dye and no additional treatment is needed. Although most useful with living cells, these dyes can also be used with fixed cells. Now, the Herx dyes have been around for decades and do require UV excitation. And now we have other choices. Dicycle violet excites well with the violet laser line. Dicycle green uses the common 488 excitation laser. Dicycle orange can be used with 488 and 532. And dicycle ruby can be used with any excitation source from 488 to 633 and emits in the far red. So there are several dicycle dyes that can be used to fit into your experimental design. So here are some examples of DNA content cell cycle analysis with some four of the live cell dyes. These are all staining Jacquat T cells, not necessarily from the same experiment, so the profiles will be slightly different. Uh, we have the Herx on the upper left, dicycle violet on the upper right, dicycle green on the lower left, and dicycle orange on the lower right. Stoichiometric binding of the dye to DNA occurs when the amount of DNA is equivalent to the amount of bound dye. And a dye which is specific for DNA and which binds in a stoichiometric manner will have a theoretical G2, G1 ratio of 2.0. The accuracy of a DNA content measurement is reflected by the amount of variation between cells with identical DNA content. And here are the percent coefficient of variation, or percent CV, of the G0, G1 peak, or the peak width, is considered an index of the accuracy of the DNA content measurement. Uh, having that in your back pocket, live cell staining will produce results which are more variable than cells which have been fixed. So fixed cells will actually give a tighter profile than live cell staining. So here's an example of vibrant dicycle ruby. And again, this is using two of the different excitation laser lines, 488 and 633. Um, however, alternate laser sources like 532 and 561 will also work very well with Dicycle Ruby. Live cell dyes allow for the possibility of sorting based on DNA content, as in this example, with mouse fibroblasts stained with Dicycle Orange and sorted based on their uh, different phases of the cell cycle. You can see post Sort verification of the sorted populations is shown, and the subsequent growth of the populations is verified by showing a growth pattern of sorted cells three days after growth. The live cell dyes have very simple staining protocols. This is taken from the actual product information sheet where cells are in suspension, the dye is added, they're incubated, and then the um, the sample is acquired on the flow cytometer without washing. Instrument performance, sample preparation, and sample acquisition can have a significant impact on cell cycle measurements. Also, the manner of data analysis is important. And I'm not going to go over each of these in detail, but we will be presenting a webinar later in 2012 on specific tips and tricks to help make your cell cycle testing successful. So look for this uh, in the upcoming year. Until then, I do have a couple of important points I'd like to bring up. One thing to mention 
is that when performing cell cycle analysis on live cells, it is a good idea to remove the dead cells from the analysis. Uh, the dye cycle stains will enter both live cells and dead cells. So here's an example showing a population that contains a significant number of dead cells. And we have used Cytox Blue dead cell stain to identify the dead cells and gate on live cells for the DNA content measurement. And this does improve the quality of the histogram. Um, the DNA content is no different in dead cells, but the difference is due to the conformational changes that the DNA goes through in the process of dyeing and how the DNA is labeled. So in general, with any live cell assay, it is important to eliminate the dead cells from the analysis for the most accurate results. The other thing I'd like to talk about is sample flow rate. With conventional flow using hydrodynamic focusing, uh, increasing the flow rate does result in greater variability of results or increased coefficient of variation. In this particular example, labeled cells were collected at a low flow rate of around 12 microliters per minute as displayed on the left. Without taking the sample off of the SIP tube and changing to a high flow rate of around 60 microliters per minute, the sample was acquired again and the results are seen on the right. And you can see there is a clear increase of CV and decrease in the overall quality of the histogram at the high flow rate. With hydrodynamic focusing, the sample is injected into a stream of sheath fluid where it is completely surrounded by sheath. The sample core is centered in the sheath fluid where the laser beam will interact with the cells. Based on principles relating to laminar flow, the sample core remains separate but coaxial within the, the fluid stream. The flow of sheath fluid accelerates the particles and restricts them to the center of the sample core. This process is known as hydrodynamic focusing. Where the sample core is narrow, as in this example, with a low flow rate, the cells interact with the laser beam optimally and a narrow distribution is seen. To increase, increase the flow rate with hydrodynamic focusing systems, the speed of the sample core does not change, but rather the width of the core within the sheath fluid increases, which allows more cells to enter the core stream at a given moment. With a wider sample core, some cells can pass through the laser beam off-center and intercept at a less optimal spot, increasing variability of signal. And this results in a wider distribution of data and the resolution is decreased. This limitation, the trade-off of speed and sensitivity, has largely been accepted by the flow cytometry community and it illustrates the need to use a low flow rate for samples such as DNA content for very precise results are required. So here's an example of this using alcohol-fixed jercat cells stained with propidium iodide. On the left, you can see the uh, histograms at three different flow rates, 12 microliters per minute, 35 microliters per minute, and 60 microliters per minute. And on the right, you can see the percent CV and the S phase percent as uh, measured by each of these. The percent CV does increase as the flow rate increases, and what is uh, really dramatic is that the S phase percent as you get to a high flow rate does change. In contrast to that with acoustic focusing, it does not matter how wide the sample core is, the cells are always placed into the very center using acoustic forces where the cells will interact with the laser in an optimal manner. This gives precision at any speed. Because of this, sample rates can also be dramatically increased up to 1,000 microliters per minute where very high, highly precise measurements are now possible. So here's an example using the same jercat cells which have been alcohol fixed and stained with propidium iodide. And on the left, you can see collection with the Attune acoustic cytometer starting at 25 microliters per minute and increasing up to 1,000 microliters per minute, where the CV does not really change over the uh, increased speed, and the percent S phase is consistent across that. So any collection rate using acoustic focusing can be used for DNA content analysis. 
Here's just one more example. This is using a different cell type, HL60 cells. These, are, again, are alcohol-fixed and this time labeled with FX cycle violet. And on the left, the cells gave a CV of 6.1%. And on the right, using acoustic cytometry, the CV is a, a much lower 2.1%. So the side population technique is a common method for the identification of stem cells. In this technique, the cell permeant dyes either Herx using UV excitation or dicycle violet using violet 405 excitation is loaded into the cells. Stem cells subsequently pump out the dye via an ABC membrane pump-dependent mechanism, which results in a low fluorescent tail when the cells are analyzed using flow cytometry. Again, tips and tricks of the side population technique will be the topic of an entire webinar in 2012, so please look for that. All right, so we come to our first polling question, and this is a question for our audience members. You can submit your answers right now. Uh, this is the question, true or false? You don't need to identify dead cells when doing proliferation studies in live cells. So I'll repeat the question and submit your answer right now. True or false? You don't need to identify dead cells when doing proliferation studies in live cells. So I'll wait about five or ten more seconds uh, for you to answer. All right, well, I see that 92% uh, of you have correctly identified the response as false. It is important to identify and eliminate dead cells from the analysis for accurate results in live cell testing. So now let's move on to fixed cell assays for DNA content. Uh, fixatives have two functions basically to pre preserve the cells by preventing lysis and autolytic degradation. It also makes the cells permeable, and thus their DNA is now accessible to fluorochrome binding DNA uh, dyes. Precipitating fixatives, such as alcohols, are preferred for single-color cell cycle. Uh, disadvantages uh, include that some epitopes are destroyed and there is more cell aggregation. Cross-linking fixatives like aldehydes can have uh, a bit of a harmful effect on the stoichiometric of DNA staining, but fewer epitopes are destroyed and less cell aggregation is induced. Uh, there are um, a couple of options. FX cycle dyes are useful for DNA content in fixed cells. On the left, we show FX cycle violet, which uses the violet 405 laser. And on the right, we see FX cycle far red, which uses the 633 red laser. This allows for the use of a common 488 blue laser for other markers. So here is an example of both of these dyes used to label DNA content in a multicolor uh, assay with phosphohistone H3 with alexafluor 488 to identify cells in mitosis. So once again, by using these two dyes, you can use the common blue 488 laser um, with FITC or PE markers that are uh, much more common. So now let's move on to another method of measuring cell proliferation using our cell trace dyes. So cell trace violet and cell trace CSFE proliferation kits provide versatile and well-retained cell tracing reagents for generational analysis of cells. The cell trace dyes easily diffuse into cells where they are cleaved by intracellular esterases to yield a highly fluorescent compound. This compound covalently binds to intracellular amines resulting in a homogeneous, stable, and well-retained fluorescent staining. Because the binding is covalent, it is compatible with aldehyde fixation. As the labeled cells divide in culture, half of the fluorescent label is passed to each daughter cell, resulting in a serial halving of the fluorescence intensity in subsequent generations. The staining protocol is very simple. 
dye is diluted in DMSO, and a working stock solution is made. Cells are incubated for 30 minutes, quenched and washed, and then you can proceed with the stimulation. So here's an example of a simple multicolor experiment using cell trace CSFE with stimulated human lymphocytes. And uh, then uh, the use of the dead cell stain Cytox Blue and a direct conjugate of CD8 Q.605. So the first thing is to eliminate dead cells from the analysis by gating on the Cytox Blue negative cells, as you see in the plot on the left. And then gate on the CD8 positive cells uh, in the middle. And then finally on the right plot, we see the proliferation with uh, cell trace CSFE of the live CD8 positive cells. Cell trace CSFE, however, occupies a very popular channel. It's the same that is used for FITSI and for GS GSP. So it is uh, desirable to have a dye that has very similar qualities and performance to CSFE, but with different spectral qualities. And for that, we have developed Cell Trace Violet, which uses the 405 violet laser line and has an emission around 450. It is fully compatible with GFP and other dyes used in the first channel of the blue laser. So here we see stimulated human lymphocytes labeled with Cell Trace Violet on the left and unstimulated lymphocytes labeled with Cell Trace Violet on the right. The non-proliferating labeled cells provide a reference point for the fluorescence intensity of the parent generation of cells. So this generational data can be analyzed in third-party software packages as displayed above. And uh, the tips and tricks on the cell trace technique will be the topic of an upcoming technical webinar in 2012, so stay tuned for that. So here's an example of a simple multicolor experiment using cell trace of violet with stimulated lymphocytes. Um, they have been labeled with the dead cell dyed Cytox Advanced and a direct conjugate of the antibody CD4, Alexa 4, 488. Again, the first thing is to eliminate dead cells from the analysis by gating on Cytox Advanced negative cells and then gate on CD4 positive cells to look at the proliferation of the live CD4 positive cells as seen on the plot on the right. In this example, you can see by the statistics that just over 1 million total events were collected. So we have a second polling question here. So you can uh, submit your answer right now. True or false, cell trace dies by covalent, bind covalently and can be formaldehyde fixed. So again, go ahead and submit your answer now. True or false, cell trace dyes by bind covalently and can be formaldehyde fixed. I'll give you about five more seconds. And I see that 93% uh, of you have correctly identified this as true. Uh, these dyes do bind covalently to intracellular amines, and because the binding is covalent, fixation is possible. So now we'll move on to the direct S phase measurement using the Clicket EDU cell proliferation assay. So this shows the histogram from the instrument on the left, and as already discussed, it is very difficult to accurately put markers on the different phases because there are three overlapping distributions. And often software packages are used to extract this information based on probability modeling. However, what about DNA content plots that look like this? These are A549 lung cancer cells, which were stained with a live DNA content dye and then modeled with ModFit. Um, the DNA content histograms do look unusual. You may ask the question, where is the S phase? Is this modeling accurate? Or did my staining even work? And there's nothing wrong with these histograms, but they are not normal. The top plot shows a topocide-treated cell. A topocide is a G2M 
cell cycle block. The bottom plots are nicotazole treated, which is, is a, a different G2M block. And there may be times like this where a direct S phase measurement may be desired. So another method of measuring cell proliferation is using a thymidine analog. To measure the rate of cell proliferation, living cells are treated with a nucle nucleoside analog, which is taken up and incorporated into the DNA. The analog can be radioactive thymidine, bromodeoxyuridine, or BRDU, or more recently, a final deoxyuridine, also known as EDU. These cells can be processed and the analog specifically detected. Structurally, these are very similar. There is a modification in the terminal position of the pyrimidine ring of these analogs. The click chemistry describes a concept introduced to describe a set of chemical reactions for use in chemical library synthesis that describe chemistry that generates substances quickly and reliably by joining small units together. Of this, one reaction has become known as the click reaction, which is between an azide and an alkyne. Catalyzed by copper, a covalent bond is formed. This reaction has proven to be highly efficient, rapid, stable under physiologic conditions, and most importantly, bioorthogonal. This means that the reaction components, an azide and an alkyne, are not normally found in biological systems and therefore react very selectively. This can be applied to labeling DNA using a thymidine analog. In this application, the EDU contains a terminal alkyne group, which reacts with a fluorescently labeled diazide, which forms a strong covalent bond, thus labeling the double-stranded DNA. So here we see uh, radioactive thymidine. This was initially used. It can be incorporated into actively synthesizing DNA. And I think we all can understand the drawbacks of using radioactivity. Um, in the 1970s, the BRDU technique was introduced. And in this technique, uh, BRDU is incorporated into actively synthesizing DNA. The incorporated BRDU is detected with an antibody. However, the antibody cannot ac access the incorporated BRDU. And detection with the BRDU antibody does require DNA denaturation or detection. Numerous protocols have been developed for this, including acid, heat, or nuclease for the DNA denaturation. And this is the most cumbersome and tricky step in the procedure. Once the DNA has been denatured, the anti-BRDU antibody can then bind to the incorporated BRDU. So in 2007, the Clicket EDU method was introduced. This uses the thymidine analog, EDU. Again, the EDU is incorporated into actively synthesizing DNA. However, this is detected using click chemistry, and the click labeling does not require DNA denaturation, and the diazide will react with the double-stranded DNA. And the DNA is now labeled covalently. It is the small size of the diazide which allows it to get into the incorporated analog and react. You can see from the molecular weight scale on the bottom that the azide and the alkyne combined are quite small, especially when compared to the size of an antibody. So what does this mean for flow cytometry? Uh, well, it's a very streamlined protocol. There is a, a simple fix and perm of the cells is all that is enabled, needed for labeling of the incorporated analog which occurs within 30 minutes at room temperature in an aqueous buffer solution under mild conditions. Uh, this is a typical results that you will see in the upper left shows the EDU detection. The positive cells are a direct S phase measurement. In the upper right, we show DNA content and on the uh, lower bottom, we uh, combine these two in a dual parameter plot 
showing the typical horseshoe shape where you can actually put a region around uh, the uh, cells in the S phase and uh, get a direct S phase measurement. There are three different kits for flow cytometry with three different azide colors for use with the blue, violet, and red lasers. And we have different packaging sizes to meet your particular needs. So here's an example of uh, the Attune Acoustic Cytometer using Clicket EDU F, uh, Alexafluor 488 and FX Cycle Violet. This was collected at a standard transit time of 100 microliters per minute. And you can see that uh, the typical horseshoe-shaped uh, dual parameter plot is seen. This was collecting 50,000 total events. If we move on to this next slide, this is the same data. However, it's collected at 1,000 microliters per minute, so uh, very quickly. Uh, this only took a few seconds to collect 50,000 total events. And then here's an example of the Attune uh, blue-red configuration, which uses the Alexafluor 647 azide, and shown here with propidium iodide for DNA content. And briefly, I'll finish up with a discussion of a new technique for measuring changes in proliferation. This is a dual pulse labeling using EDU and BRDU together. So this technique uses sequential pulses of EDU and BRDU without removing the EDU from the media and without media replacement. The BRDU detection is using a clone of BRDU, MOBU1, which shows no cross-reactivity with EDU. And the EDU detection is using click chemistry, which is bioorthogonal and shows no cross-reactivity with BRDU. Um, this is a, a new method for measuring changes in proliferation. Um, and the, re, the reaction and the detection of the EDU and BRDU is very clear. So it's a, a snapshot of DNA synthesis at a point in time. So this shows when cells are treated with EDU. The EDU is incorporated into cells replicating DNA. And then without wash or removal of media, BRDU is added. Cells that have already completed DNA synthesis will not incorporate BRDU and will express EDU only. Cells newly entering the S phase will incorporate BRDU and express BRDU only. And cells in S phase during both pulses will express both EDU and BRDU. And you'll see um, typical plots like this, um, where uh, these are uh, TF1 myeloid progenitor, pro progenitor cells, which were treated with EDU for one hour, and then treated for with BRDU was added for another hour without removal of the EDU or the washing of the cells. The cells were fixed in ethanol, and the acid denaturation method was used before labeling with the MOBU Alexafluor 647 antibody, and Clicket Alexafluor 488, and for DNA content, FX Cycle Violet was used. The histograms on the top row show the individual parameters of EDU on the left, BRDU in the middle, and DNA content on the right. And on the bottom row, we see dual parameter plots of, on the left, EDU versus BRDU, and in the middle, DNA content versus BRDU. And on the right, DNA content versus EDU. Um, so the, the cells are colored blue, which are negative for both EDU and BRDU. Cells are colored dark green, which are positive for both EDU and BRDU. Cells are colored red, which are positive for EDU, but negative for BRDU. Uh, so these are the cells that are positive for only the full, first pulse, that of EDU. And then cells colored a light green are negative for EDU but positive for BRDU. And these are the cells that are positive only for the second pulse of BRDU. 
So there are three colors of direct conjugates of BRDU antibody clone MOBU1. And, of course, if you are doing the BRDU technique, this antibody works perfectly fine for that. Uh, so there's uh, Alexa 4488, Alexa 4647, and Pacific Blue, as well as an unconjugated. So that brings us to the end of this webinar. Um, you can submit your questions. I thank you for your attention, and I'd like to remind you that our next webinar is on January 12th, which is an overview of viability, vitality, and apoptosis reagents. So I, uh, I can see that there have been several um, questions submitted um, about uh, asking if this presentation will be available after the webinar. And yes, in uh, a day or two, this webinar will be available on the Life Technologies website. And uh, a couple of questions about schedule for future dates. Um, of webinars, and currently we have the time for the next webinar, January 12th, and we will communicate uh, the schedule for the other webinars as they are available. So we do have a question about um, do we have any dye um, that can quantitate the cells in the G0 phase of the cell cycle? Um, based on DNA content, uh, no, so you have to look at some other things such as um, RNA content, and there are some different things like KI67 or uh, pyronin Y that can be used, and uh, you have to um, really use something other than DNA content to look at that distinction between G0 and G1. So I have another question. Um, how long are the DNA samples stable for at four degrees um, when using the vibrant dyes. And um, it, this is going to really depend on which of the vibrant dye cycle dyes you're using. So if you are going to be using vibrant dye cycle violet, that is best kept at 37 degrees until the moment of acquisition. Um, the other uh, vibrant dye cycle dyes can be labeled uh, or kept at room temperature, but I would not um, uh, store them at four degrees. So um, there is a question about um, sorting S phase and um, uh, difficulty in uh, determining the cell cycle based on the uh, MDR pump, regardless of inhibition or temperature. Um, so uh, I would suggest that you do not use the Herx dye or dye cycle violet because those will uh, be pumped out. Um, you can use um, specific pump inhibitors, but you have to find the correct one for the cell type that you're using. However, we have not seen um, the, um, the dyes be pumped out with uh, dye cycle green, or dicycle orange or dicycle ruby. So you might try one of those dyes instead. Um, uh, there is a question about quenching in the staining protocol for cell trace. And um, there is a step where um, you do want to um, absorb all of the extra dye in there. And um, this is done through the use of adding um, a serum in the staining protocol. I don't know. There is a question asking if CSFE um, would not work. I guess I'm not. I'm not sure. I get that. If if cells are known where CSFE would not work, I'm not aware of uh, certain cell types that might not work with the cell tracing technique. But um, of course, I haven't tested every uh, cell type available. Um, I, I would be very interested in, in knowing from members of our audience if they have found um, particular cell types that don't work with cell tracing.
So there is a, a very good question about the effect of cell tracer dyes on cell proliferation itself. And you could expand this to say any um, any dye that is being used to label a live cell can have an effect on the cells, uh, depending on the cell type and the concentration used. And this is something that um, during our development of these products we certainly look at, but we can't test every possible cell type or condition. So I would suggest that this is something that you look at yourself within your particular test system. So there is a question about the Clicket EDU reaction. Is it compatible with GSP? And the current uh, formulation, no, it is not. However, you can detect your GSP with an anti-GSP. That does uh, bring up the um, uh, question about what is, uh, are there any other things that are not compatible with the Click reaction? And due to the copper, which catalyzes the reaction, it does have a detrimental effect on RPE, RPE tandems, and quantum dots. And uh, there is a workaround to that is that uh, you label with uh, RPE or quantum dots after the click reaction. And uh, by then, the copper has been washed out. Um, CSFE, there's a question about um, uh, is it toxic at high doses? And uh, yes, the, the higher you go with uh, any dye in a live cell assay, the more likely it is to um, be toxic to the cell system. And this is one of the reasons why you do want to use a dead cell stain in case there is a high death rate. But of course, you want to optimize your particular situation and your cells um, to uh, minimize the, the amount of cell death. So CSFE detected with 488 laser is so bright that it could give no specific, can it give other specific signal in other channels? Um, uh, for CSFE or cell trace violet to work, yes, it has to be extremely bright so that you can see subsequent generational analysis. And um, you do have to be careful about um, bleed through into other channels. Um, I don't know specifically if this uh, is excited by the 561 laser. Um, it, it's uh, probable that it has some amount of uh, excitation, and I would suggest that you do compensate. So there is a question about click it. In what form is the copper catalyst applied and removed? So the um, we do it is uh, supplied as a copper two plus. However, it is a copper one plus that actually catalyzes the reaction. So we do have a reducing agent in the click reaction mixture, and uh, once that uh, is applied uh, to the reaction components, it's a very quick reaction, and uh, this is removed with a wash step. So it is possible to use one of the vibrant dye cycle stains um, with the EDU uh, click it detection system. However, the uh, EDU system does require that cells be fixed and permed for detection of the EDU. Um, so it is not a live cell assay. Um, there are possibilities of using EDU for labeling in vivo. And um, this has been done, especially with mice. Um, uh, there is a question about any particular recommendations for this application. And um, if you have ever used BRDU, you can use those particular guidelines for your EDU um, testing in vivo as well. So there's a question about uh, can EDU be used with other fix and perm methods? And yes, we have tested the click reaction with uh, numerous fix and perm reagents. Um, if you have uh, a different fix and perm for other things that you're multiplexing with this, um, we haven't tested all of them, but um, we haven't identified any fixatives uh, that do not work. Uh, 
Um, there's a question about uh, what uh, inhibitor could be used with uh, stem cells and uh, fumitamogorgon C or verapamil can be used, but again, it's going to depend on the particular um, uh, cell type that you're using. And I, I think that's it for right now. So again, thank you for joining us. And I look forward to um, the webinar on January 12th.